like you said, you are one of the experts in insulin resistance and metabolic flexibility. And there's been a lot of chatter um, in the internet world of things with nutritionists, doctors that say that insulin resistance is actually Um, that we may need a little bit of carbohydrates for insulin sensitivity. So too low of diets without carbohydrates can cause um, insulin to not work well. And so it's not ideal. And then there's some people that say, actually, nowadays, it's really the PUFAs that are causing the insulin resistance, um, or that the cells itself are becoming insulin sensitive because of the excess PUFAs, which then make people gain weight. Mm -hmm. And then some people are like, no, it's the, you know, sugar insulin model. I figured we should ask the expert, you know, what is causing insulin resistance? Right. Yeah. In fact, Judy, your, your question there, you brought up a lot of things like the difference between insulin resistance and glucose tolerance and, and now uh, the, the origins of insulin resistance itself. So briefly, I'll answer that, um, that question directly. Um, insulin resistance, just so the audience has uh, and looks at it the way I do, insulin resistance is really a, a coin with two sides. Now, the coin that I would be holding this allegorical coin would be called insulin resistance. And this is the insulin resistance that we see in the human body, whether it is those more clinically um, relevant cases of pathological insulin resistance, or whether it's the physiological insulin resistance that happens during puberty and during pregnancy. But regardless, anytime we're calling something insulin resistance in the body, it's this coin with two sides. On one side, is the fact that insulin isn't working the same way that it used to. So the hormone insulin isn't able to do all the things it used to at some of the cells of the body. Emphasis on some of the cells. Most of the body cells respond to insulin as well as they ever did. So it's not like it's a global or universal phenomenon within the body. But the other side of that coin is hyperinsulinemia or chronically elevated blood insulin levels. These two things will always come together compromised insulin signaling and chronically elevated insulin itself. Whether it, again, whether it is a pathological insulin resistance that's making the person sick or whether it is the physiological insulin resistance, which is helping that boy or girl grow very rapidly during puberty, or whether it's helping mommy's body and baby to be's body grow um, in order, you know, throughout the pregnancy in both, in all of these instances, it's the combination of those two variables or both sides of the coin. You can't have one without the other. So that's insulin resistance just by way of a common definition. Then the origins of insulin resistance, as you note, is very, very debated. So I, in an effort to try to simplify it and distill what I believe um, all the data suggest into the simplest concepts, I think one way of looking at it is looking at insulin resistance as being a result of primary causes or a result of secondary causes. With regards to primary causes, these are variable, these are stimuli that can cause insulin resistance independent of anything else. And it can cause it all around the body at every at various cells, at fat cells, muscle cells, liver cells, et cetera, brain cells. And so the there are three primary causes of insulin resistance, as I define it. And, and by that I mean you can take humans and and isolated cells. And if you expose them to all three of these things that I'll mention in a moment, then they'll become insulin resistant. And they, that is elevated levels of inflammatory proteins, so inflammation, elevated levels of stress hormones, I mean, that's cortisol and epinephrine. And then lastly, chronically elevated levels of insulin. So inflammation, stress, and insulin. Now, inflammation and stress are so widely thrown around these days. You know, in, in pop culture, everyone wants to blame everything on stress or blame everything on inflammation. And so I'm being very careful using those words, but when we can detect elevated levels of inflammatory proteins or hormones, um, then the body will become insulin resistant as a direct result. Same with those stress hormones, cortisol and epinephrine. Everything else can be fine, but if those hormones are up for too long, then the body starts to become insulin resistant. And then what I believe is the most relevant, because you can change it so quickly, Mm -hmm. is the chronically elevated insulin, where too much insulin is causing the body to become resistant to it. So those are the primary causes. And then the secondary cause, I believe is uh, something like linoleic acid is, is a prime example of that because you can't treat cells with like muscle cells with linoleic acid and then they become insulin resistant. It doesn't happen. The same with, with neurons in the brain, it doesn't happen. What can happen 
is that linoleic acid, now linoleic acid can do all kinds of bad things in the body from these refined seed oils, but just for the, um, to see it through the lens of insulin resistance, I believe it's secondary because when the fat cells start to accumulate linoleic acid, it forces the fat cells to grow through a process called hypertrophy. And when the fat cells are each individually getting too big, rather than multiplying in number, then those bigger or hypertrophic fat cells become insulin resistant. And so the, in other words, the seed oils can promote insulin resistance through the body, but it would be in part due to what it's doing at the, at the fat cells by making the fat cells grow in a harmful way. And then the fat cells are promoting the insulin resistance throughout the body. So to sum it up, primary causes, inflammation, stress, and insulin itself, and then secondary causes like linoleic acid from refined seed oils. Could you have a scenario where the primaries are relatively normal, but then the secondaries are enough that it can cause insulin resistance? Or would some of the primaries have to be occurring? That's a great question. Um, I, I don't think you could cause insulin resistance with just seed oil. I don't. Because as much as linoleic acid is going to provoke, promote a fat cell to grow through hypertrophy, sure. you would still have to have some signal to tell the fat cell to grow, which something like insulin, for example. So, so you'd have to, yeah, you'd have to, because the fat cell, linoleic acid alone is not mm-hmm. going to force the fat cell to grow. Um, a fat cell can only grow if it has a growth signal in the form of insulin. Sure. Um, so I think you'd have to kind of combine those where you'd have elevated insulin. Now, even in, in, a, in, a, in a body, you could have elevated insulin. It would be promoting fat growth either through hypertrophy or hyperplasia. And hyperplasia is a healthy way to get fat, paradoxically, where each fat cell stays quite modest, um, but you just have more of them. Anyway, it's a long-winded way of saying, I, I don't believe linoleic acid alone is sufficient to cause insulin resistance. There would have to be some other stimulus promoting the growth of the fat cell, like the elevated insulin or cortisol, which also can induce fat cell growth in certain parts of the body. Okay. So then what, if I'm hearing you correctly, it seems like factors like stress and inflammation in the body and just, you know, lifestyle has a bigger role on insulin resistance um, than maybe some of the dietary intake, well, just specific to maybe linoleic acid. Those are more, almost more important because let's say your diet is clean, likely you're eating meat based and you're maybe having some veg- veggies occasionally, but mo- you know, mostly whole foods. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if your insulin is still high or you have some bit of inflammation, maybe sometimes it can be the stress. Is that like something lifestyle related? Can that be? A- oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So like with stress, um, something as simple as a bad night of sleep, which I know very well with little kids, um, it's, it, if someone sleeps poorly one night, they will have demonstrable detectable insulin resistance the next day. That, that is something that can be quantified in, in a lab. And it is entirely a result of the elevated cortisol because of the bad sleep. Now, thankfully that very kind of rapid onset insulin resistance can be corrected by just one good night of sleep. But you can imagine all of these variables coming into play in the average person where the average individual has terrible sleep habits They have terrible dietary habits where they're eating refined starches and sugars every two or three hours. So their insulin's elevated all the time. And they may or may not be exposing themselves to foods or chemicals that are aggravating their immune system and thus increasing inflammatory proteins. And to top it all off, in addition to those primary causes, they're eating their carbs from bags and boxes with barcodes, which means that the fats in them will always be seed oil fats high linoleic acid. So it is just an absolute perfect storm of variables that are coming in to play to create insulin resistance. And and I think it's important for me to emphasize that as much as I'm talking about stress, inflammation, insulin, and even linoleic acid as all distinct in their ability to induce insulin resistance in our environment, you simply have all of them. And so trying to tease them out or rank order them, which one's worse, I I can't do that. I don't know of any studies that have attempted to, you know, say which one is worse than the others. And, and I would almost say it, it doesn't matter. Right. We have all of them. 